or latent features. They're these hidden things that were there all along, and once we train this neural net, they suddenly appear. Right. Now, here's the problem. No one's going to like Battlefield Earth, right? It's not a good movie, even though it has John Travolta in it. So how are we going to deal with that, right? Because there's this feature called, I like John Travolta movies, and this feature called, this movie has John Travolta, and so this is now like, you're going to like the movie, but we need to have some way to say, unless it's Battlefield Earth, or you're a Scientologist, either one, right? So how do we do that? We need to add in bias. Right, so here is the same thing again. Same weight matrix, uh, sorry, not the same weight matrix, it's the same uh, construct, right? Same shape of everything. But this time we've got an extra row. So now, this is not just the matrix product of that and that, but I'm also adding on this number and this number. Which means now each movie can have an overall, this is a great movie versus this isn't a great movie. And every user can have an overall, this user rates movies highly or this user doesn't rate movies highly. So that's called the bias. So this is hopefully going to look very familiar, right? This is the same usual linear model concept or linear layer concept from a neural net that you have a matrix product and a bias. And do you remember from lesson two, the lesson two SGD notebook, you never actually need a bias. You could always just add a column of ones to your input data, and then that gives you bias for free. But that's pretty inefficient, right? So in practice, all neural networks library explicitly have a concept of bias. We don't actually add the column of ones. So what does that do? Well, just before I came in today, I ran a tools solver, or now it's data solver, on this um, as well. Uh, and we can check the RMSE. And so the root mean squared here is 0.32 versus the version without bias was 0.39. Okay, so you can see that this um, slightly better model um, gives us a better result. And it's better because it's, it's, it's giving both more flexibility Right? And it's also just makes sense semantically that you need to be able to say it's not the, the whether I like the movie is not just about the combination of what actors it has and whether it's dialogue driven and how much action is in it, but just is it a good movie? Okay, or am I somebody who rates movies highly? Okay, so there's all the pieces of um, this collaborative filtering model. How are we going, Francisco? Any questions? We have three questions. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, our first question then is, um, when we load a pre-trained model, can we explore the activation grids to see what they might be good at recognizing? Uh, yes, you can. And we will learn how to, um, should be in the next lesson. Um, can we have an explanation of what the first argument in fit one cycle actually represents. Is it equivalent to an epoch? Yes. The first argument to fit one cycle, or fit, is number of epochs. It's, um, uh, in other words, an epoch is looking at every input once. So if you do 10 epochs, you're looking at every, uh, every input 10 times. And so there's a chance you might start overfitting if you've got lots and lots of parameters and a high learning rate. If you only do one epoch, it's impossible to overfit. And so that's why it's kind of useful to remember how many epochs you're doing. Can we have an explanation? Uh, no, I did that one. What is an affine function? Uh, an affine function is a linear function. Um, I don't know if we need much more detail than that. Uh, if you're multiplying things together and adding them up, it's an affine function. Um, I'm not going to bother with the exact mathematical definition, partly because I'm a terrible mathematician and partly because it doesn't matter. But if you just remember that you're multiplying things together and then adding them up, that's the most important thing. It's linear. Okay? And therefore, if you put an affine function on top of an affine function, 
That's just another affine function. You haven't won anything at all. That's a total waste of time, right? So you need to sandwich it with any kind of nonlinearity, pretty much works, right? Including replacing the negatives with zeros, which we call ReLU. Okay, so if you do affine, ReLU, affine, ReLU, affine, ReLU, you have a deep neural network. Okay, so, um, so let's go back to the collaborative filtering notebook. And this time we're gonna grab the whole um, movie lens 100K data set. Um, there's also a 20 million data set, by the way. Um, so uh, really a great uh, project um, available, uh, made by this group called Group Lens. Um, they actually update the movie lens data sets on a regular basis, but uh, they helpfully provide the original one and we're gonna use the original one because that means that we can compare to baselines. Because everybody, basically they say, hey, if you're gonna compare to baselines, make sure you all use the same data set. Here's the one you should use. Unfortunately, it means that we're gonna be restricted to movies that are before 1998. Um, so maybe you won't have seen them all, but uh, that's the price we pay. You can replace this with ML latest um, when you download it and use it if you want to play around with movies that are up to date. Okay, um, the original movie lens data set, the, the more recent ones are in a, a CSV file that's super convenient to use. The original one is a slightly messy. Um, first of all, they don't use commas for delimiters, they use tabs. So in pandas, you can just say what's the delimiter when you load it in. Um, the second is they don't add a header row so that you know what column is what. So you have to tell pandas there's no header row. And then since there's no header row, you have to tell pandas what are the names of the columns. Other than that, that's all we need. Okay, so um, we can then have a look at uh, head, which remembers the first few rows, and there is our, um, our user, uh, ratings, uh, user movie rating. And let's make it more fun. Let's see what the movies actually are. Um, I'll just point something out here, which is there's this thing called encoding equals. I've got to get rid of it. And uh, I get this error, Unicode. I, I just want to point this out because You'll all see this at some point in your lives. Codec can't decode, blah, blah, blah. What this means is that this is not a Unicode file. And this will be quite common when you're using data sets that are a little bit older. Um, back before, you know, us folks in the West really realized that there are people that use languages other than, well, English people, English uh, languages other than English. Um, uh, nowadays, you know, we're much better at handling different languages. We use this um, standard called Unicode for it, um, and Python very helpfully uses Unicode by default. But so if you try to load an old file that's not Unicode, you actually, believe it or not, have to guess how it was coded. Um, but since like it's really likely that it was created by, you know, uh, some Western European or American person, uh, they almost certainly used Latin one. Uh, so if you just pop in encoding equals Latin one, if you use file open in uh, Python or pandas open or whatever, uh, that will generally get around your problem. Um, um, again, they didn't uh, have the names, so we had to list what the names are. This is kind of interesting. They had a separate column for every one of however many genres they had, uh, 19 genres. Um, and you'll see this looks one hot encoded, but it's actually not, it's actually N hot encoded. In other words, a movie can be in multiple genres. We're not going to look at genres today, but it's just interesting to point out that this is a, a way that sometimes people will represent something like genre. In the more recent version, they actually list the genres directly, which is much more convenient. Okay, so um, I find life is, so we've got 100,000 ratings. I find life is easier when you're modeling, when you actually denormalize the data. So I actually want the movie title directly in my ratings. So pandas has a merge function to let us do that. So here's the ratings table with actual titles. So as per usual, we can create a data bunch for our application, so a Colab data bunch for the Colab application from what? From a data frame. There's our data frame. Um, set aside some validation data. Um, really, we should use the validation sets and cross-validation approach that they used if you're gonna properly compare with a benchmark. So take these comparisons with a grain of salt. Um, by default, um, Colab Data Bunch assumes that your um, 
first column is you, uh, user, second column of item, third column is rating, but it, now we're actually going to use the title column as item, so we have to tell it what the item column name is. Um, and then all of our data bunches support show batch, so you can just check what's in there, and there it is. Okay. Um, so I'm going to try and get as good a result as I can. Um, so I'm going to try and use whatever tricks I can come up with to get a good, a good answer. Now one of the tricks is to use the um, Y range. And remember, the, the Y range was the thing that made the final activation function a sigmoid. And specifically, um, last week we said let's have a sigmoid that goes from 0 to 5. And that way it's going to ensure that it kind of, it's going to help the neural network predict things that are in the right range. I actually um, didn't do that in my um, Excel version. And so you can see I've actually got some negatives. Right? And there's also some things bigger than 5. So if you want to beat me in Excel, you could, you could add the sigmoid to Excel and train this, and you'll get a slightly better answer. Um, now, the problem is that a sigmoid actually asymptotes at, say, whatever the maximum is. We said 5. Right? Which means you can never actually predict 5. But plenty of movies have a rating of 5, so that's a problem. So actually, it's slightly better to make your Y range go from a little bit less than the minimum to a little bit more than the maximum. And the minimum of this data is 0.5, and the maximum is 5. So this range is just a little bit further. So that's, a, that's one little trick to get a little bit more uh, accuracy. Um, the other trick I used is to add something called weight decay. And we're going to look at that next, OK, after this section. We're going to learn about weight decay. So um, then, how many, how many factors do you want? Well, what are factors? Uh, the number of factors is the width of the embedding matrix. So why don't we say embedding size? Maybe we should, but in the world of collaborative filtering, they don't use that word. They use the word factors because of this idea of latent factors. And because the standard way of doing collaborative filtering has been with something called matrix factorization. And in fact, what we just saw um, happens to actually be a way of doing matrix factorization. So we've, we've actually accidentally learned how to do matrix factorization today. Um, so, so this is a term that's kind of specific to this domain. Okay? Um, but you can just remember it as the width of the embedding matrix. And so Y40, well, this is one of these architectural decisions you have to play around with and see what works. So I tried 10, 20, 40, and 80, and I found 40 seemed to work pretty well. Um, and it trained really quickly. So like you can chuck it in a little for loop to try a few things and see what looks best. Um, and then for learning rates, I use the learning rate finder as usual. Um, so uh, 5e neg 3 seem to work pretty well. Remember, this is just a rule of thumb, right? 5e neg 3 is a bit lower than both Silvan's rule and my rule. So Silvan's rule is find the bottom and go back by 10. So his rule would be more like 2e neg 2, I reckon. Uh, my rule is kind of find about the steepest section, which is about here, which again, like often it agrees with Silvan, so that would be about 2e neg 2. I tried that, and I always like to try like 10x less and 10x more just to check, and actually I found a bit less was helpful. So the answer to the question like, should I do blah, is always try blah and see. But that's how you actually become a good practitioner. Uh, so that gave me 0.813, right? and as usual you can save the result to save you another 33 seconds from having to do it again later. And so um, there's a, 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 a library called Librec, and they publish some um, benchmarks for um, movie lens 100K, and there's a root mean squared error section, and about 0.91 is about as good as they seem to have been able to get. Uh, 0.91 is the root mean squared error. We use the mean squared error, not the root. So we have to go 0.91 squared, which is 0.83, and we're getting 0.81. So that's cool. Um, with this very simple model, um, we're doing a little bit better. Um, quite a lot better, actually. Um, although, as I said, take it with a grain of salt, because we're not doing the same splits and the same cross-validation. Uh, so we're at least 
highly competitive with their approaches. Okay, so we're going to look at the Python code that does this in a moment. Uh, we're going to look at the Python code that does this in a moment. Um, but for now, just take my word for it that we're going to see something that's just doing um, this, right? Looking things up in an array and then multiplying them together, adding them up, and doing the mean squared error loss function. Um, so given that, and given that we noticed that the only way that that can do anything interesting is by trying to kind of find these latent factors, um, it makes sense to look and see what they found, right? Particularly since, as well as finding latent factors, we also now have a specific bias number for every user and every movie, right? Now, you could just say, what's the average rating for each movie? But there's a few issues with that. In particular, this is something you see a lot with like anime. People who like anime just love anime, right? And so they watch lots of anime, and then they just rate all the anime highly. And so very often on kind of charts of movies, you'll see a lot of anime at the top, right? Particularly if it's like, you know, a hundred long series of anime, you'll find, you know, every single item of that series in the top thousand movie list or something. So how do we deal with that? Well, the nice thing is that instead, if we look at the movie bias, right, the movie bias says kind of, once we've included the user bias, right, which for an anime lover might be a very high number because they're just rating a lot of movies highly. And once we account for the specifics of this kind of movie, which again might be people love anime, right, what's left over is something specific to that movie itself. So it's kind of interesting to look at movie bias numbers as a way of saying what are the best movies or what, people, what do people really like as movies, even if those people don't rate movies very highly or even if they do, that movie doesn't have the kind of features that people tend to have rate, rate highly. So you get this kind of nice, um, <laughs> it's funny to say this, and by using the bias, we get an unbiased kind of um, movie score. So um, how do we do that? Well, um, to make it interesting, because particularly because this data set only, start, only uh, goes to 1998, um, let's only look at movies that are plenty of people watch. Right? So we'll use pandas to grab our rating movie table, uh, group it by title, and then count the number of ratings. I'm not measuring how high they're rating, just how many ratings do they have. Okay? And so the top thousand is, the, is the, are the movies that have been rated the most, and so they're hopefully movies that we might have seen. Okay, that's the only reason I'm doing this. And so I've called this top movies, by which I mean not, not good movies, just movies we're likely to have seen. So not surprisingly, Star Wars is the one that at that point most, the most people had put a rating to. Um, Independence Day. There you go. So um, we can then uh, take our learner that we trained and ask it for the bias of the items listed here. Okay. So is item equals true, you would pass true to say I want the items or false to say I want the users. Right. So this is kind of like a pretty common piece of nomenclature for collaborative filtering. Uh, these IDs tend to be called users. These IDs tend to be called items. Even if your problem has got nothing to do with users and items at all, you know, we just use these names for convenience. Okay? So they're just, they're just words. So in our case, we want the items. Uh, this is the list of items we want. We want the bias. So this is specific to collaborative filtering. And so that's going to give us back a thousand numbers because right? we asked for, this has a thousand movies in it. So we can now take, um, and, and just for comparison, let's also group the titles by the mean rating. So then we can um, zip through, so going through together, uh, each of the movies along with the bias uh, and grab their rating and the uh, bias and the movie. And then we can um, 
sort them all by the zero index thing, which is the bias. So here are the lowest numbers. Um, so I can say, you know, Mortal Kombat Annihilation, not a great movie. Lawn Mower Man 2, not a great movie. I haven't seen Children of the Corn, but we did have a long discussion at SF Study Group today, and people who have seen it agree, not a great movie. Um, and you can kind of see, like, some of them actually have pretty decent ratings, even though, like, relative to, right? So this one's actually got a much higher rating than the next one, right? But, you know, that's kind of saying, well, the kind of actors that were in this and the kind of movie that this was and the kind of people you, who, who like it, who, who watch it, you would expect it to be higher. And then here's the sort by reverse, okay? Schindler's List, Titanic, Shawshank Redemption, seems reasonable. And again, you can kind of look for ones where, like, the rating, you know, isn't that high, but it's still very high here. So that's kind of like, you know, at least in 1998, people weren't that into Leonardo DiCaprio, or, you know, people aren't that into dialogue-driven movies, or people aren't that into romances or whatever, but still people liked it more than you would have expected. So it's interesting to kind of, like, interpret our models in this way. Um, we can go a bit further and grab not just the biases, but the weights. So that is these things. And again, we're going to grab the weights for the items for our top movies. And that is 1,000 by 40 because we asked for 40 factors. So rather than having a width of 5, we have a width of 40. Um, often, um, really, there's, there isn't really conceptually 40 latent factors involved in taste. And so trying to look at the 40 can be, you know, not that intuitive. So what we want to do is we want to squish those 40 down to just um, three. Uh, and there's something that we're not going to look into called PCA, stands for Principal Components Analysis. So um, this is a um, movie W is a torch tensor and uh, FastAI adds uh, the PCA method to torch tensors. Um, and what PCA does, Principal Components Analysis, is it's a simple linear transformation that takes an, an input matrix and tries to find a smaller number of columns that uh, kind of cover a lot of the space of that original matrix. Um, if that sounds interesting, which it totally is, you should check out um, our course, Computational Linear Algebra, which uh, Rachel teaches where um, we will show you how to uh, calculate PCA from scratch and why you'd want to do it and lots of stuff like that. Um, it is absolutely not a prerequisite for anything in this course, um, but it's definitely worth knowing that taking layers of neural nets and chucking them through PCA is very often a good idea. Because very often you have like way more activations than you want in a layer, and there's all kinds of reasons you would, might, might want to play with it. For example, um, Francisco, who's um, sitting next to me today, um, is, uh, has been working on something to do um, um, uh, image similarity, right? And for image similarity, a nice way to do that is to compare activations from a model, um, but often those activations will be huge, and therefore your thing could be really slow and unwieldy. So people often, for something like image similarity, will chuck it through a PCA um, first, and that's kind of cool. In our case, we're just going to do it so that we take our 40 uh, components down to three components, so hopefully they'll be easier for us to interpret. Um, so we can grab um, each of those three um, factors. We'll call them factor 0, 1, and 2. Um, and um, let's grab that movie components and then sort. And now the thing is, um, we have no idea what this is going to mean, but we're pretty sure it's going to be some aspect of taste and movie feature. So if we print it out, the top and the bottom, we can see that the highest ranked things on this feature, you would kind of describe them as, um, you know, connoisseurs movies, I guess. You know, like Chinatown, you know, really classic Jack Nicholson movie. Uh, everybody knows Casablanca. And even like Wrong Trousers is like this kind of classic 
claymation movie, uh, and so forth, right? So, yeah, this, this is definitely measuring like things that are very high on the kind of connoisseur level. Um, where else, maybe Home Alone 3, not such a favorite with connoisseurs, perhaps. Uh, it's just not to say that there aren't people who don't like it, right? But probably not the same kind of people that would appreciate Secrets and Lies. Okay, so you can kind of see this idea that this has found some feature of movies and a corresponding feature of the kind of things people like. So let's look at another feature. So here's factor number one. Um, so this seems to have found like, okay, these are just big hits that you could watch with the family, you know. Uh, these are definitely not that, you know, train spotting, very gritty kind of, you know. Thing. Um, so again, it's kind of found this interesting feature of taste, and we could even like draw them on a graph, right? I've just cataloged them randomly to make them easier to see, and you can kind of see like, and this is just the top uh, 50 um, most popular movies uh, by rating, uh, by how many times they've been rated, and so kind of on this one factor, you've got the head of the Terminators really high up here, and the kind of English patient and Schindler's List at the other end, and then kind of is your godfather and Monty Python over here, and Independence Day and Liar Liar over there. So you get the idea. So that's kind of fun. Um, it would be interesting to see if you can come up with some stuff at, at, uh, at work or other kind of data sets where you could try to pull out some, some features and play with them. Um, so, how does that work? Um, any questions? One. One. Okay. Um, the question is, why am I sometimes getting negative loss when training? You shouldn't be. So um, you're doing something wrong. Uh, so ask on, uh, 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 show us your, your I mean, particularly since people are upvoting this, I guess other people have seen it too. So, so Put it on the forum. I mean, um, they said they're doing negative log likelihood. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we're going to be learning about um, cross entropy and negative log likelihood after the break um, uh, today. Um, they are loss functions that have very specific expectations about what your input looks like. And if your input doesn't look like that, then they're going to give very weird answers. So probably you pressed the wrong buttons. So don't do that. Uh, okay. Okay, so we um, said collab learner. Um, and so here is the collab learner function. Um, the collab learner function, as per usual, takes a, um, uh, a data bunch. And normally learners uh, also take something where you ask for a particular architectural details. In this case, there's only one thing which does that, which is basically, do you want to use a multi-layer neural net or do you want to use a classic collaborative filtering? And we're only going to look at the classic collaborative filtering today. Um, uh, or maybe we'll briefly look at the other one too. We'll see. Um, and so what actually happens here? Well, basically, we're going to cre we create a, um, an embedding dot bias model and then we pass back a learner which has our data and that model. So obviously all the interesting stuff is happening here in embedding.bias. So let's take a look at that. I clearly pressed the wrong button, embedding.bias. There we go. Okay, so here's our embedding.bias model. Um, it is a nn.module. So in, in PyTorch, to remind you, uh, all PyTorch layers and models are nn.modules. They are things that, once you create them, look exactly like a function. You call them with parentheses and you pass them arguments. Um, but they're not functions. Uh, they don't even have, normally in Python, to make something look like a function, you have to give it a method called um, Dunder call. Remember that means underscore, underscore, call, underscore, underscore, which doesn't exist here. And the reason is that PyTorch actually expects you to call, have something called forward. And that's what PyTorch will call for you when you call it like a function. So when this model 
is being trained uh, to get the predictions, it's actually going to call forward for us. So this is where we um, do the calculations, right? Uh, to calculate our predictions. So this is where you can see we grab our, um, why is this users rather than user? Well, that's because everything's done a mini batch at a time, right? So it, it's kind of, when I read the forward in, um, in a PyTorch um, module, I tend to ignore in my head the fact that there's a mini batch and I pretend there's just one because PyTorch automatically handles